All right, folks, I want to welcome our guest to the show. It is none other than Cliff Barackman. Welcome to the show, Cliff. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. It is my pleasure. I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule. I know you're a busy man, and it took some time for us to work out this scheduling issue, so I really appreciate you being here. That's yeah, um, no big deal. Persistence is a key uh, um, personality thing for big footers in general, and especially if you want me on a podcast. You really got to hound me. So, <laughs> Well, I had every – I pulled the hounds out. I had – Alex Highcheck, I had Doug on you. I think I had Michael Freeman on you. I had Tate Hieronymus on your trail. So I put out a bunch of feelers to get you on the show. So I really do appreciate it. And I'm glad that you're here. Yeah. I've, I've got a ton of questions, as I was telling you a little bit before we went on the air, about some of the things that my listeners want to hear about. But one of the things that has really been bugging me recently is I had a conversation with Pat from Squatch Talk. I was a guest over on his show toward the end of the year last year. And we had this conversation about the Patterson Gimlin film putting us on the five yard line back in 1967 and Bigfoot research. And we kind of feel like we're stuck there, right? There's been a ton of things that have happened, but not recently. There's not been a whole lot of movement and a momentum. So I wanted to kind of start the, the questioning there for you. Do you have that same feeling? Do you feel like we're sort of stuck on the five yard line? And is there anything that you can come up with outside of somebody producing a body that would push the ball down the field and Bigfoot research? Hmm. Well, I do agree that we're 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 not moving forward very dramatically. I mean, there's been a lot of interesting bits of information and pieces of evidence that have come forth to move the ball a little bit further down the court, so to speak. But at the end of the day, um, and I was reflecting upon this actually because I was reading um, the newsletter from the Bay Area Group, and I think it was either Archie Buckley or it was uh, Warren Thompson. I, I'd have to go back and check. They wrote a, a thing back in like 1969 or 1971, but kind of summarizing the state of Bigfoot research and what we think we know. And it hasn't changed much since since then. There's been a few tweaks and stuff, um, tweaks to the model, so to speak, just like in uh, things like gravity or evolution or any of those things that like we know for a fact happen. They're always tweaking. And that's why they're so-called theories, right? Um, and and so the th the theory of Bigfoot, I guess, in this case, is still being tweaked a little bit. Um, we know a little bit more about their feet. We know a little bit more about their placements. I think perhaps, or I have some uh, interesting tidbits and hints of their placement on the family tree. Yeah, things like that. Um, but it has it. But um, we're not any closer because if, at the end of the day, it's going to be a body or a big chunk of it. Um, although there, there is some possibility now that I think that, uh, which is good, getting to the answer of the question, I think eDNA ha um, ha is an interesting um, avenue that we need to uh, explore more thoroughly, um, even to the point where they're now doing eDNA studies through the air which I think is very, very interesting. Um, they were doing some tests. I just recently found this out, actually. They're doing tests about sampling DNA in the air at zoos, and they were um, able to recognize over 70 species available at that zoo of mammals. Um, and so maybe that's a good way forward, although with the, the sparse population density of Sasquatches, I'm not sure that would do anything. But nonetheless, I think that there's some interesting technologies that are going to maybe push the ball a little bit further down the court towards uh, academic acceptance of the species. Um, but at the end of the day, people going out and trying to get pictures or um, that sort of stuff, it's, it's not going to do much about proving the species. Um, it'll be interesting. It'll be fascinating for us Bigfoot nerds. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not going to do much. W what we need is a body or a big piece of one. And I'm not trying to collect one, but I just know that that's what science takes. Um, but I, I have also had interesting conversations with like talk, Dr. Todd Disitel. Um, who's a skeptic and sh he should be skeptical. Um, uh, everybody should be skeptical of whatever comes across their way, uh, their desk there. But he said that he believes that repeated DNA with repeated footprints and repeated video, um, good quality video from one area will probably uh, alleviate the need for a type specimen. That's not to say they're not going to go out and kill one anyway. They will. Science will do that because they want to study the insides. Um, there's no way to do that through a picture. But, um, but I don't know. I, I think that's where the effort needs to be put at this point. Um, cause I, I, unless you're a gun guy, I'm not a gun guy. I've got a couple of firearms, but I'm not a gun guy. Um, and therefore I have no business trying to shoot something like that. Um, but yeah, I think that the effort should be put in one of those areas. If, if proving the species is your personal goal, um, that's not really my personal goal. I, I don't really care what other people think. Um, I'm, I'm just enjoying learning about the, the animals themselves. So that's my goal. I'm trying to learn about them. Um, and as a test to see if I'm right, then maybe we'll, I'll get footage at some point. We'll see. One of the things that I sort of argued with Pat on the show about was it was the Freeman footage. 
And I saw that footage uh, years ago, obviously. I think it was late 90s when, when this, maybe mid 90s when he captured this film. And I was on the fence about it. And I had Michael on the show when the Freeman files, the book came out and Michael and I were talking and he and Doug had sent me the copy of what Doug Highcheck had been working on to enhance this footage. And I was blown away. I have to be honest because I'd never seen some of the things that I saw in this particular video. And I wanted to talk to you about that because that's one of the things Michael mentioned was that you had also been looking into that film and you'd done your own research and your own things to enhance that footage a little bit. So can you talk a little bit about maybe folks may not be familiar with the Freeman footage, what that is and your involvement in trying to maybe enhance that and where you were on it before and maybe after some of the enhancements? Well, I think the Freeman footage is interesting. There's not a lot, there's not a ton of information in it, unfortunately, because the media that he used is a magnetic tape. It's, it's, is it high eight or super eight? I, I forget. I think it's super eight. I'm, could be wrong about that, uh, but it's basically a magnetic tape. So it has the, inf the kind of information that like a cassette tape would have versus like a digital CD, you know, um, and stuff deteriorates over time and whatnot. So unfortunately, it, that, that doesn't have the information that the Patterson Gimlin film has in it because the Patterson Gimlin film was taken on Superchrome film, which is a really, really information dense um, media. Um, the Super 8 magnetic tape stuff is not. Um, and so we're limited by that. Um, and also um, the way that, uh, the, see the original tape um, has the best version of it on. So, but all the digital stuff that's out there, almost almost every, I think I'm gonna say every copy, though I could be wrong about that, um, of the film that's out there is, was exported um, using interlaced technology. Um, interlacing um, footage is like, imagine, you know, imagine like a film strip. It doesn't work like this, but this is a good analogy where there's a picture here and a picture there that's a little bit different and a picture here. And when you go by, your your mind fools you into thinking that the image is moving. That's what film is, basically. Um, well, somebody at one time invented this idea. It's like, well, you know, what if we take this this frame and then this frame and then combine them a little bit and have them overlap so they're interlaced? And that's what the technology is of, of the digital versions of the footage that have been put out online. I, I, to my knowledge, every copy of this is interlaced. But I, again, I could be wrong. I'm wrong all the time, you know, but that's what I get for speaking so much about Bigfoot. I'm going to be wrong a lot when that happens. Right. Um, so what we did at the NABC here, the North American Bigfoot Center, the, my Bigfoot Museum, um, we exported it from the original the original tape that Michael Freeman brought to us. We he did a speaking event here um, this past August on the 30th anniversary of the footage. So um, when Michael was here, he brought out the original and we exported um, a non interlaced version. And it's actually better. It's actually just better. Um, you can see the, the um, artifacts in the footage itself of the interlacing. Um, it it kind of looks like lines inter doing it actually looks like interlacing of lines um, on the footage itself. Um, the version we have here at the NABC doesn't have that. So even without doing any of the contrasts um, that Doug uh, did or, and the high checks did, because Alex was really deeply involved in that, I think, too, um, even without doing any of the, the playing around and twisting the knobs a little bit, it, it already looks better. It already, and again, there's, there's not a lot of information there. I'm being honest with you, but it already looks better. Um, and I always thought that the, the Freeman footage was interesting. I did. I told Michael this and you and I. Uh, Maybe I ruffled his feathers a bit, but at first I didn't really like it because it bothered me that the Sasquatch looked down before it took a step, which would be a, re a reasonable behavior for someone wearing a suit, right? Um, but as it turns out, um, there's a lot of other things about the piece of footage, the, the footage itself that I really like. Um, and also now that I know Michael and have heard what he knows about it, because Michael's a very honest guy. He's the, the good, bad, and the ugly. He'll just tell you about it. Um, uh, Michael's um, perspective on the film and what he witnessed when his father came home that day it was very compelling. Um, I try not to put too much faith or stock or uh, emphasis on any one particular witness's accounts because witnesses are just so fallible. But the way that you know Michael talks about his dad and whatnot, um, and and seeing his dad's face and stuff, that was I found that to be very compelling. Um, but really, what sets the the footage aside for me as and puts it in the real bin as opposed to a fabrication are the footprints. Because the, the, the footage itself, I don't think there's enough information in to do much with. It's interesting. It's cool. But the footprints, that is a known individual from the data set. Um, I have a very large collection of Sasquatch footprints uh, at my disposal. I think second only to Dr. Meldrum. If I, if I could be wrong about that, too. But I, that's what I believe to be true. And I know Jeff has more because whenever I get one he doesn't, I give it to him. You know, I make him a copy because for 
you know, for me, they're baseball cards, stuff that I can learn from and uh, nerd out on. And, and But for him, he can turn other academics heads. And, and that should be a, a, a goal for all of us is to get other academics interested in the subject because the evidence holds up. Um, in my opinion, it holds up. And I think that uh, once people get past the nonsense that usually is the filter, like the, 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 the face of the subject and get into the evidence, it's hard to, it's very compelling. It's hard to deny it all. But the footprint cast at uh, the footprints at the Patterson, or at the Freeman site, that is a known individual. That's the same individual that Dr. Meldrum cast in 1996. Uh, at five points, that's the same individual that um, that uh, uh, that left the 1991 Seven Mile Trackway. Um, that's that, that that is a well-known individual in the data set. Um, so that I, I think the footprints are real. They're found at the site. Therefore, the subject is real. That's my logic on it. Well, I didn't know the in-depth information. Michael and I got into the footprints a little bit, but I didn't know that information that they'd been cast before, and it was a known individual in the data set that really sends it over the edge for me. And I got, a, I got into that conversation with Thomas Steenberg and, you know, Thomas was a really big proponent of Freeman's work forever. And then he just changed and became this, he was completely on the side of him being a hoaxer. And I told, you know, explain told why, by the way, because I've never had that conversation with, I know, Tom, I know that I know that to be true about Thomas. And I, I love, I, I love Mr. Steinberg. He's great. I, I respect him tremendously. I think he's one of the best investigators and researchers that have been ever period. But I, I, I still don't know why he thinks that, um, that the Freeman stuff is not true, you know, and don't get me wrong. There are hoaxed footprints in the Freeman data. Well, the blue mountain data set, I should say, I, that's another misnomer. That's not all the Freeman stuff. There were many researchers collecting their data and working together. So Freeman gets the, the, the billing, but it's not fair to people like Wes Summerlin or, or Bill Lowry or Dar Addington or uh, David Bean or any of these people that were out there with him. So, but anyway, do you know why Thomas says that he doesn't believe the Freeman stuff. The only thing that we got into was that apparently what he told me was he had admitted Paul Freeman had admitted to faking footprints. Oh, that's the good morning America thing. Right. And yeah. that's the only thing that he told me was that he had admitted it. And Michael and I talked about that. He said, absolutely. There are faked footprints in there. If you cast as many footprints as his dad did, and he honestly didn't cast a lot of footprints in the big scheme of things for the amount of time he spent in the woods, boots on the ground looking for these things. But yeah. he did have fakes, admittedly, in his collection, which makes sense. Well, yeah, Everybody's and then the Good Morning it. America, like hatchet job, too. You Don't forget that because they, they they edited him. They franken in, in, in the TV business. I happen to know that that's called frankenbiting, um, where you make them say what you want them to say. Um, and you, there's even more extreme examples of that where they can make me say almost anything by piecing together, you know, things. But yeah, um, I've made fake footprints too, um, but I've never put them forth as evidence. I've made them in my garden, just like Mr. Freeman did, just like Dr. Meldrum has, just like any good researcher would. Um, and, you know, I resisted that for a long time, just for the same reason I, I, I don't own a monkey suit, you know, because if I ever get footage, people are going to accuse me of having faked something. And actually I do now own a monkey suit, by the way, um, uh, for the museum, but also I have the, the crappiest looking one I could get because no one would ever believe it anyway. Right. But I'd never um, bothered making fake, fake stompers and stomping around because I didn't want to be accused of hoaxing. Um, but, but, uh, but oddly enough through the, um, through the London track and the LB track events of 2012, um, I, I, I convinced one of the people involved in one of these hoaxes to make me a, a, a pair of stompers. And uh, I did experimentation. I'll tell you, I learned more about real footprints by doing those experiments than I think I ever could have otherwise. So I would recommend everybody make some crappy stompers of some sort and go stomp around to see what kind of uh, signatures they leave in footprints. If you're interested in footprints, maybe you're not, I don't know. Um, but if you're interested in footage, you know, get a suit, go walk around. I, I mean, I, I did a, um, I did a fake thing back in, God, it must've been 2008 or 2010 or something like that. Uh, Cause I wanted to see what suits look like on thermal imagers. Um, so uh, a friend of mine had access to this um, monkey suit and this one had a, a had like a, a tutu, like a ballerina tutu attached to it. So there was no concern about thinking it was going to be used as a hoax. Um, but we, we filmed me running around. Then we, we filmed me running around in the woods with, with the monkey suit on running around just normally and actually running around naked in the woods, just because I wanted to see what, and through a thermal imager, what does that look like? And that, that was also a very informative experiment, you know? 
It's one of the best conversations I ever had with anybody about footprints and foot casting was Tom Shea. And Tom admitted he knows that he has went out and casted tons of, not tons, but several tracks that were fake. Mm -hmm. And he learns from that. That was one of the conversations that I wanted to get out there when I had that with Thomas, because he's one of the best that I know of that's in the area, in the Southeast where I'm at, but in the United States that are really going out and doing these kind of things. And he's captured. I know you have most everything Tom has ever casted in your collection well, as well. That's not even true. Not even close to true. Actually, Tom has a lot. I don't even know how much Tom has. Um, I haven't been out. And I don't get out that way very often because I just can't afford to go flying around the country and stuff. But when I'm out in Kentucky doing another job, like I couldn't do it this year. Um, but last year after a cryptid con, which was in Lexington, I think, or I think it was in Lexington. Um, or Frankfurt, but I think it was Lexington. Uh, I, I, I set aside a couple of days at the end of the trip um, before my flight home to go visit with Tom. And then we got, we got a cast. We got footprint casts on that trip. It was great. But um, one time I was out there a couple of years ago and Bobo was with me. I asked Tom, hey, I've got a day or what? Can we drop by the night? And they're, yeah, sure. Come on over. And he and he brought out two tubs. And um, and uh, and we went through those two tubs. And he goes, so, so how many more? He goes, oh, I don't know. I just grabbed these off the top. I don't know. There's lots of tubs full of the I don't have anywhere close to everything Tom has. I probably have a, do- a dozen, maybe 10 or a dozen um, casts from Tom. Um, and I know that that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I would really like to get in and dig deep into his um, his collection, though, I'll tell you. Yeah, he's definitely interesting to talk to. If you guys haven't listened to that, you go back into the archives and listen to that show. It's one of the best that I've done so far. You mentioned it, so I'm going to skip ahead in some of the questions here, Cliff, and talk about... The London Trackway. Jake had a question about your biggest your biggest disappointment when it comes to any piece of evidence that you've either collected or been a part of. And Daniel Perez sent me a message and uh, from the Bigfoot Times and asked he wanted to know your current thoughts on the London Trackway. So it's kind of a, a two part question. What's your biggest disappointment as far as evidence that you've either been a part of or seen, and what's your current thoughts on the London Trackway? I think my disappointments in, in any evidence would be evidence that I, I didn't get. Um, that I knew there were prints in the ground. And by the time I showed up, I couldn't get them. I couldn't find them, that sort of stuff. Um, you would think that the London tracks would be my biggest disappointment, but they're, in a way they're not. Um, yeah, I, I would have preferred them to be real, but at the same time, they weren't. Um, and I'm confident of that because of my own experimentation. Um, and uh, But I learned so much from them. That's what, that's, it was the London tracks. Well, there were there were some problems with the London tracks, and unfortunately, when they when they appeared, I was on the road with finding Bigfoot, you know, and so I was gone for five or six weeks or more at a time. I'd have a week and a half home, and then I'd be back on the road for five or six weeks at a time. I just wasn't home, and luckily, those surfaced at a at a time where I was home, and I had a chance to get down there and pull them. And I cast seventy two that night, I believe. Um, I think it was 72 that one night. And then I managed to scrape up copies of some other ones. And uh, and a lot of them looked really good. If I would have just gone down there and cast one or two footprints, I would probably still think they're real. Um, but uh, when I cast, like I said, I think it was 64 consecutive ones and then a handful of other ones um, that I thought were interesting in some sort of way. And the consecutive ones are, were really interesting. A lot of them looked really wonderful. And, and but uh, But there were some red flags that popped up. Um, but I, I didn't get to those red flags for quite a while, unfortunately. And I wish I would have got to them sooner. Um, but because, uh, again, I was gone. I got them. I put them in the garage. Five, six weeks later, I come back. Um, by then, they were cured. So I hosed them all down um, and started trying to take pictures of them. And then when I was on the road, I, I was I started sorting those photographs into files and separating them and then going back to my video footage and trying to identify the cast and tie that to the footprint in the ground. And um, and so there are a lot of a lot of my time on the road, what little time I had. And then when I was home as well, was spent cataloging and sorting and f- kind of file management in a way, because it was a just a huge amount of evidence. Um, and so. But but at, by doing that over time, and it took probably like took six months or a year or more, um, there were some things that were jumping out to me that really didn't sit well with me. Um, uh, number one and most important amongst it, there was no horizontal toe splay from print to print. There was there were differentiations in depth of the toes, um, 
but and that, and that initially convinced me when I was saying, I was like, oh, look at this, look at this. And uh, I was very impressed because I, I was just looking for differences in toe position. But but when I started seeing that there were no uh, horizontal toe splay differentiation, that started giving me some concerns. And then I noticed that some of the, the depths were, were, were planar in, in, um, in nature, uh, planar. In other words, like you have a, a flat plane and I can, I can roll this in various ways to make various toes go deeper, especially if it's not a solid front like this is and like had like prosthetic toes. By doing that, it would, I could actually create some of that stuff. And I started getting concerned. Well, in the meantime, the LB hoax came up. And so we busted that hoax pretty quick. Uh, Matt Pruitt really did most of the sleuthing on that one. Um, but after that was done, I reached out to one of the people involved in that hoax and said, hey, um, you, you don't happen to know anybody with a pair of fake stompers I could borrow, do you? And the, the, the guy made them for me. He said, oh, I'm, I'll make you a pair. I've always kind of wanted to. And it turns out, well, I don't know, long story. I won't even go into that. But um, uh, um, so he made me a pair and I borrowed them for about six months or a year or something like that. And I ran through various substrates and I took photographs of my footprints and I cast my footprints and did all that sort of stuff. And then all of those red flags that I found in the London tracks, I could find in my own fake ones. And therefore, therefore, they're fake. I understand that some folks are still kind of holding on to this hope that they might be real, but I just don't see any way that could be true. Um, when the experimentation brings up um, and shows you the same red flags, you know, in my, my experiments as what I saw on the ground, that's a one-to-one -one connection right there. Um, I think that's pretty compelling. Um, but by doing that, I really, what really stood out to me is like, okay, I've got a few more markers, a field markers, we can call them about what to identify or how to identify fake footprints. But the real footprints just stand out from the background all the more strongly. So it was really one of the most informative um, educations that I, that I put myself through. So I can't say that the London tracks were a huge disappointment because I am better off now having studied those and the LB hoaxes, um, the two big hoaxes. I've dealt with small individual hoaxes here and there and whatever, but um, those are the two big ones that really taught me the most. So I'm actually a better researcher now, I think, than I was beforehand. Um, so I can't call those disappointments, you know? Um, it, I, call it, I call it educate. You don't, you, don't, you don't improve by being successful all the time. You know, you need these things. Um, and heck, man, I'm on TV saying that these things are real. We did a Finding Bigfoot episode on that. I'm just wrong, you know? And, the, and But that's, the, that's also, I think, perhaps something I can offer to the Bigfoot community because we're such an ego-driven group of people, you know? It's all about me, 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 me. Well, how about, it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to think something and then change your mind later it, as new information comes in. You don't have to uh, hold on to something you said eight years ago and still think it to be true. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm a living example of that. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't hurt my ego. It's like, oh, I got a little egg on my face, but pff, I like egg. That's cool. You know? So I, that, that's my thought on that. So I, I can't say that the London tracks were a huge disappointment. I would have preferred them to be real, but the fact that they weren't, well, I don't know, life gave me lemons. So I made lemonade, you know? Awesome. So you, you mentioned finding Bigfoot. There's a few Quick questions I want to get out of the way that people have asked about finding Bigfoot. The first one is from Joey. She asked, why did you participate in finding Bigfoot? Have you had a personal visual encounter of a Sasquatch? And what does your family think about Bigfoot in general and your participation on the show? Why did I participate? Well, it sounded like a fun opportunity, basically. Um, the way they pitched it isn't quite the way it happened, but, I'm, but nonetheless, it, it, I think it happened pretty well. I'm, um, I'm very happy with my finding Bigfoot years. Um, I learned a lot about the animals, a lot about the animals um, during those eight or nine years of doing that. Uh, because, you know, I was contacted in 2019 and we went off the air and we filmed the pilot in 2010 and we filmed the first season in 2011 and we went off the air in 2018. So, you know, do the math however you choose, but that's about eight or nine years of doing the show. I learned a lot about Sasquatches. Um, uh, but that's why I did it because like, okay, why, who wouldn't? What a, what a neat opportunity to drop in my lap. Um, 
And, and, and looking back, I, I, I kind of was naive about a lot of stuff, especially the t television industry and all that sort of stuff. But we sorted all that stuff out. I think we made a pretty good show. I mean, I don't like television in general. I think most television is garbage. Um, it's insulting, in fact, a lot of it. Um, but I think at the end of the day, yeah, it's a pretty decent show. And and, and I, I say that because I've removed myself from that now. I don't when I if I. I actually, I, I um, my wife Melissa and I, um, we watched a, um, a Finding Bigfoot episode like maybe in December or January. We I don't watch them or anything like that. I don't even usually watch the stuff that I do when it when it just comes out. But we actually sat down and watched one, and and I, I laughed, you know, and because I've removed myself, that's not me anymore. You know, that was some other guy who looks and sounds a lot like me and has a weird sense of humor. Um, but but now when I watch the show, I, I I kind of enjoy it in a way. Um, because not it's it's a travel log. I was there, you know. It's like looking through a photo album. But also, uh, uh, having removed myself from the circumstances, I, I go, oh yeah, it was a kind of a fun show uh, in in a lot of ways. Um, we were doing real Bigfoot stuff, despite what people say. I mean, we were doing real Bigfoot stuff. Like we never we never lied about the Bigfoot stuff ever ever ever. Yeah, I'll be honest. We didn't have to take a, a helicopter to get somewhere or a, a speedboat. That's just cool. That's just fun. That's fun TV stuff in the same sort of way that I would set up a lesson in my fifth grade classroom when I was an elementary school teacher. I set it up with something fun to bring, bring the kids along on an adventure with me. That's what they do in television. Um, but uh, I, don't, I can't speak for other shows. I don't know much about the production stuff, I, but I will say that our show is real. Um, I don't trust television. I, I, it seems to be a really great way to manipulate mass numbers of people um, and lie, essentially. But I, I don't know enough about the other shows. I can't really trust any of the other shows, any of the paranormal stuff or ghosts or any of that stuff. Heck, I know some of the people who were involved in hoaxes on other ghost shows. Like, I just don't trust TV. But on our show, it was all real stuff. You know, so when I look at it, oh, that was I remember I remember those vocalizations. I remember that knock. I remember that witness, you know, so it's it's, it's fun in that sort of way. For me at this point and uh at the time i didn't know what i was in for but i'm glad i did it that's for sure but there were two other parts of that question i don't remember what they are now because i was rambling for so long sorry no that was an excellent answer to the question her other part yes. of the question was have you had a visual encounter with a sasquatch and what does your family think about your participation on the show right. and your your bigfoot work in general yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um well I, I saw one on the show it turns out I saw one on the very, very first night investigation we ever did. The North Carolina thing where Moneymaker chases the thing off the hill. Um, I'm pretty confident that was a Sasquatch. I saw it through a thermal imager for about eight seconds or so. Um, it walked in a very inhuman way. Not like Patty from the Patterson Gimlin film at all. Um, but in in similar manner as I've heard witnesses describe their Bigfoots walking. Um, and also as one color head to toe um, through a thermal imager, which implies it wasn't wearing clothing. And it was February in the mountains in the North Carolina. So it probably would be wearing clothing. But what I saw was one color head to toe navigating a wooded hillside, with a hillside without a light at 2.30 in the morning. Um, Moneymaker chased after it, thinking it was somebody spying on us or whatever it was in his mind at the time. Um, and uh, he never could get close to it. And Matt had lights and thermal imaging and night vision and all this other stuff. And this thing was just like zip through the woods with nothing. Um, and then we also got vocalizations off that same hillside later, um, which uh, is something that happened a fair amount on the show. If it didn't happen on camera, you guys don't get to see it because there's no camera there filming it, right? But a lot of times we would get activity after being done or the Sasquatch would follow us back to base camp. And when we're doing interviews and like doing stuff at three in the morning, cleaning up and taking care of stuff and dealing with cameras and footage and cards and sounds. The Sasquatches would sometimes be around and we would hear them then. And this was one of those cases that we actually got vocalizations off that hillside after uh, Matt chased the thing away. Um, so I, I'm, I can't be hundred percent sure, um, but I'm pretty confident that I saw one that night. Um, I may have seen one a couple of years ago, but it was at such a great distance. I can't say for sure, but, but, you know, I'll give it a, uh, I'll give it a tip of my hat. It's like, maybe that was one too. I don't know. But the one I saw in North Carolina in 2011, I'm pretty sure it was one. Um, and as far as what my family thinks, well, my family, uh, my, my, my brother's stoked because he actually has a degree in radio film and technology and, and he has another kind of job. Um, so he's pretty excited about me working in the media industry, I guess. Uh, my parents um, who are both dead now, unfortunately, um, but uh, my parents at the time um, thought, well, well, I'll support Cliff no matter what he does because um, they love me so much. And I remember one time my, my mom, my mom and dad were really active in their church, you know, and so they'd sing in the choir. And I guess at some choir practice at some point, one of their, their church buddies said, well, what's Cliff doing? 
And it was summer. So, well, Cliff's off doing one of his Bigfoot things or whatever. He's in the woods. I'd spend most of my summers in the woods when I was a teacher. Um, and then one of their friends who they'd known for 15 or 20 years said, oh, I saw a Bigfoot one time. And then they went like, what? You know, my dad's head spins around twice. And like, what? Because like this woman is married to a retired naval admiral, like just totally upstanding member of the community, known him for more than a decade or two. And um, they go, really? Oh, and she saw one on the side of the road with uh, her grandson up by the trees of mystery in, in the, you know, Northern California. And she says, yeah, yeah, this is what I saw. And, and that's when my dad kind of came around a little bit for, uh, away from like, yeah, Cliff's an eccentric weirdo. Had a, had a, I raise that, you know, um, and, and they love me. Don't get me wrong. It's not a, it's not a slam on me, but I, I, I'm a weird guy and my parents are not weird people. I mean, they're weird in their own ways, but they didn't recognize it. Um, and that's when my dad started realizing, Oh, Cliff's again, just kind of chasing the science thing that he's been doing all of his life, you know, because I, I, my, when I was 13 years old, my dad gifted me a really nice telescope because I was so deeply interested in, um, in astronomy. Um, and I started fishing when I was a teenager at some point to relieve stress and stuff in the ocean, you know, the, the fishing in the ocean. And th that was because I was so interested in marine biology. So my, my, I think my dad recognized that um, this is just another weird science avenue for Cliff to investigate. And one that's kind of important because the academics aren't doing it. Um, and that, that's when the, the, the page turned for him. Like my mom, I mean, she just, whatever, she lo loves me. She wasn't going to say anything you know, no matter how weird I am. Um, so I think that's how my, my, my family dealt with it. Awesome. I appreciate that. So John has kind of a funny question here. He, uh, John Turley asks, do you think Squatch is like your bass playing or Bobo's rave better? Oh, um, I think that the, they're attracted to anything that they haven't heard before because they are intelligent animals. And if you do anything out of the ordinary in their environment for long enough or loud enough, they might, they might come in to take a look. And I, so I don't think it really matters at this, whether we're raving or playing bass or doing air raid sirens or, or whatever. I think if you do something unusual in a place where they are, they might come in to take a look um, because they're smart animals and, and they could, their very survival could depend on being aware of what's going on. And they know that. Well, this is kind of off the subject. I did a show a couple of weeks back on drones and Bigfoot research. And that was one of the questions that I asked the guys that I had on the show to talk about that with me was the noise that the drones make. So let me ask you, you've been out in the field and you've used tons of things to look for Bigfoot. Do you think it's possible that a, an advanced thermal drone, even with the noise and those kind of things, could be employed if we had enough money and enough people to go out and do it in the right way? And do you think it could be a useful tool in, in looking for these things? Yeah, yeah, I do, actually. I mean, I, we, we, we kind of got one on Therm um, on that reboot episode in, in uh, North Carolina or uh, West Virginia, rather, in 2020. You know, um, Rob Evans and those guys, they, they briefly had one on Therm or whatever. Um, and there's, that was the first deployment of that system. And it's a really high end system. And um, uh, so I'm not sure if it recorded or anything. I'm not sure what was going wrong that night. Lots of things were going wrong that night. It's just the way that this way. That, television is and certainly bigfoot television is that way um but yeah i, I think that uh, drones would be useful in a way to to still learn a little bit more about them it's not going to solve anything it's not going to convince people necessarily um although it's, it could be that they have a unique uh, thermal signature of some sort uh, I, I know rob evans um who was on our podcast at one time he's really into this thermal droning thing and he's got really high-end stuff he's also a computer nerd so he's written some scripts to identify various uh, mammal species based on their thermal um, signature and maybe that's something we could do with sasquatches to differ differentiate humans and them i don't know about body temperature differences but maybe there's something there um, if nothing else, if they are in the area and we happen to capture one or two or three on the, on on uh, drones, which is entirely possible, especially in the winter time, because of the lack of tree, uh, leaves and stuff on the tree, maybe we can learn a little bit about their social interactions and social structure. Um, it might be an interesting learning tool and way ahead in the future, far ahead in the future, perhaps a nice way to uh, do some non-invasive um, like population surveys and things like that. Um, but I think it's an interesting tool that has yet to be fully, um, fully explored and exploited, I guess, for, for every drop of water we can wring out of that rag. But I think it does hold promise. Yeah. 
All right, last Finding Bigfoot question. Rachel says, is there going to be a Finding Bigfoot reunion? She really misses the show. Well, I appreciate that, but not, to my knowledge, no. Although, to be fair, I didn't know we were going to do that reboot in 2020 either. But at this point, I just don't think it. I don't think that's going to be the case. So, um, which is fine. I've got a million other things going on, and you know, don't get me wrong. I'd love to take another Animal Planet paycheck, but uh, it's just that take two or three weeks out of my life to go do it um, would be a little inconvenience uh, inconveniencing at this point. But but I, mean, I would love to do it. I just don't think it's going to happen. You know. All right, Mitchell asks. Where do you feel the species falls on the evolution chart? We're talking about Bigfoot, obviously. Do you feel it falls into the realm of man? I already know the answer to this question because I've heard you answer this in, in other podcasts. Possibly connected with the missing link, or do you feel it's a completely new species of animal altogether? Well, it's it's none of the above, um, I guess, uh, would be a good way to do it because uh, those are some pretty pretty squishy terms that were being used. Are they are they humans? No, they're not Homo sapiens. That's for sure. They're, they're, Homo sapiens don't get eight feet tall. They don't get. They aren't necessarily covered in hair, even though we have those genes. They don't have feet like that. They don't have hands like that. They don't have. They're, they're not Homo sapiens. That's for sure. Um, uh, where are they on the gradient, though? There's some sort of great ape, but then again, so are we. People get really bent out of shape about that, but I don't know why. I don't know why. I, I think it's a, a, a like a lack of uh, perhaps. Um, literacy and science, essentially. But that is our family. We are a hominid. You know, great apes and humans are hominids. That is our family. Um, they are, they're one of us. We're one of us too. Um, but they're, they're not humans in that sort of way. Um, they might be hominins. I suspect that they are. I, a hominin is a fancy term. That means everything on the human family tree ever since we split off from our last common ancestor with chimpanzees about 6 million years ago. That means all of the uh, human ancestors, all the homos, that's our genus, um, they're all hominins, whether they're alive or not anymore, it doesn't matter. And so are the Australopithecines and whatever came before them as well. Those are all hominins, um, I believe, which is different than hominid. Hominid is different, uh, but hominins are our family tree. And I suspect that's where Sasquatches are. I, at this point, when you, uh, and I'll tell you, this is my reasoning for it. When you look at Sasquatch behavior, and I'm talking about tens of thousands of sighting reports, you know, and I think it's fair to say that I've spoken to several thousand witnesses, just myself. Um, but, you know, combine Moneymaker into that and Bobo and the BFRO database and all that other stuff. Tens of thousands of reports, right? Um, certain things are missing. Certain behaviors are missing. And the big ones are fashioning and using tools um, beyond simple things like, you know, like rocks breaking over, breaking open shells and stuff, uh, which is tool use. But, you know, sea otters do, don't do that, too. And we don't put them in the human family tree. Um, and and uh, although a recent study pointed out that uh, chimpanzees sometimes sharpen sticks and that's fashioning and using tools. So it's not an unknown behavior amongst the apes at all. But, we, but there's a really no, no, no real good strong evidence for Sasquatches doing that at this point. And they also don't seem to make and control fire. You know, there's a couple things of them picking up sticks from the fire or something. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. They're not making them using fire. So um, it seems to me that both of those adaptations would be too useful to discard once they were adapted. So um, I think you have to look before the earliest hominin um, that used those for, uh, comp uh, for the ancestor of the Sasquatch. And um, it turns out that the earliest hominin that we know did that habitually was Homo habilis. Um, which is also the first uh, animals that were in the Homo genus, I might add. Before that were the Australopithecines. Australopithecines, uh, uh, you might have heard of the Lucy skeleton, the Lucy fossil. That's the most famous Australopithecine. Um, and that's when we realized, oh my God, these apes were bipedal. These chimpanzee-like animals were bipedal. They walked on two legs. That's so interesting. And, um, and a lot has been discovered about them since. Um, and there, there's a lot of little details I could go into, but... but I think the big takeaway is that the Australopithecines had two main forms, a grass, a, a more slender form um, like Australopithecus afarensis, Australopithecus um, africanus, um, all those sort of things. And we think that one of those eventually rose into our common, our, our ancestors. Um, and then there's this other form called the robust Australopithecines because they were robust. They were thick and strong and massive, and they were four to five and a half feet tall. They were basically Bigfoots already. Um, I suspect that that is where we need to look for the ancestor of the Sasquatch. 
um, because they were already basically Bigfoots. All they needed to do was get bigger, which has always been a problem, right? Because we don't know if they did get bigger. We don't even know if they radiated out of Africa. All the fossils of, of, um, of the robust Australopithecines um, called Paranthropus, all of those come from Africa. And until recently, we didn't have any any indications of early hominins like that radiating out of Africa. Um, we knew that Homo erectus did because the type specimen for Homo erectus came from Indonesia, you know, from Java, Java man. Um, but now, now we know that the early, uh, the early hominins did radiate out of Africa because we have the um, Homo floresiensis um, from the island of Flores. The hobbit species is what they are kind of nicknamed. They are by all practical means uh, an Australopithecus. They're a very, very early hominin, archaic hominin. So at least Homo habilis, if not before, um, a friend of mine, PhD in paleontology says, no, those are basically Australopithecines. So we know that they radiated out at some early stage. Well, if they went south into Indonesia, who's to say that group didn't go north? And if they did go north, Bergman's rule would take over. Bergman's rule is a biological rule and um, saying that the, in, the, in colder climates, animals tend to get bigger. OK, so five feet to eight feet is not that big of a jump if we're talking about a million years, you know, of, of being subjected to those pressures um, and eventually evolution will take over and they will get bigger. And from there, if they're already living in, in Siberia and the Himalayas, maybe that's the Yeti thing, right? Uh, jumping over the land bridge isn't a big jump either, you know, at the end of the day. Um, and I, I and I'm not the guy who think th who thought all this up, of course. You know, I might have refined it a bit, but a guy named Gordon Strassenberg, who recently passed away, I think in 2019, um, he wrote a paper on this and got it published back in like 1970 or 71. This is a very old idea that I think deserves a lot more attention. Um, everybody's jumped on the Gigantopithecus bandwagon and maybe Giganos are Sasquatches, but there are some problems there. We don't know if they're bipedal. We don't even know. We don't know anything about the way they, uh, they walked or got around at all. We know a little bit about what they ate and how big they were and where they were. That's kind of about it. Um, I'd say until we know more about Gigantopithecus, well, I'm going to put that one aside and look for some other options. And I think Paranthropus in particular, um, it shows a lot of promise because they have the sagittal crest. Um, they have these really pronounced zygomatic arches on the side, which are another uh, bone structure for anchoring chewing muscles. You can see those in the Patterson-Gimlin film. The, the Patterson-Gimlin film subject, yeah, certainly, almost certainly has a sagittal crest. It's hard to say um, because because the sagittal crest is surrounded by a lot of fat and muscle and stuff, you know, in, in, in extant apes. Um, but I think it's a pretty reasonable assumption that, that it has that. But you can literally see the zygomatic arches, and they are very pronounced, which means there's a huge chewing apparatus going on, um, which doesn't bode well for the Sasquatch intelligence, I might add, because it really shrinks down the brain size. Um, and, uh, and other things, too, about, about that as well. But I, I think Paranthropus needs to be given a good, hard look. I kind of know how this next question is going to go before I ask it, but I, I told Jamie I would not leave it out. So Jamie wants to know, how do you handle encounters that take a paranormal detour? Do you archive those quantum elements that to fit science or are they thrown out altogether because science has not yet have patterns to that are required for true scientific study? And what do you think about Ron Moorhead's quantum Bigfoot theory? Okay. Um, I'm doing my best to remember all these various, my, my, uh, yeah, I only have so much RAM, but, um, these multiple part questions throw me for a loop. I'm not even sure I answered all the questions the last person asked. So I apologize about that. Um, you know, I write, I write everything down. Now, like most of my reports come in a written format. And if, if there's something I can do something about, I contact the witness and talk to him more about that. Um, and people who come in the museum here, we write, we, we, we take notes as they're, um, as they're dictating their, their story to us. Um, and we just write down whatever they say. That's raw data. That's raw data. I don't throw out any raw data. But to be very honest with you, I, I very rarely hear about anything paranormal. Um, almost never, really, when it comes down to it. Um, it, it like to a, to a point now where I think I, I, I don't know, I'd have to guess, probably about 13 or 1400 sighting reports. And um, I would say less than a dozen of them mention anything weird like that orbs and all that sort of stuff. There's, there's such an outlier that um, at, at this point, statistically, frankly, they can be ignored. That doesn't mean I don't write them down, but they can frankly be ignored. And a lot of these other, like orbs, for example, a lot of times, depending on where you are, they can have a perfectly normal explanation. Um, something called earthquake lights has recently uh, crossed my desk as a possible explanation. It was Moneymaker that told me about it. 
Matt was up in the Sierra Nevada mountains um, at the same location where the, the Sierra gate footage was obtained, the, the thermal footage up in the Sierras. Um, and, um, and it's an interesting piece of footage. I think they're real Sasquatches. And uh, of course, we interviewed the witnesses on the podcast that I do. Um, he was up in that area and he saw orbs. He saw orbs that were moving. Um, and, and I was talking to him about it. He goes, you know, I'm pretty sure those are earthquake lights. Um, and basically, earthquake lights are kind of this unexplained phenomenon, a geologic phenomenon, um, where there, where um, it usually happens on earthquake faults and um, in, in places of high granite content and stuff like that, where there's a tremendous amount of geologic pressure. And somehow or another, that pressure um, creates some sort of um, electromagnetic thing, you know, and actually it makes orbs that move, essentially, vis visual orbs that move um matt says and he was saying cliff you got to go to the spot man they are so cool I, I got to watch a couple of these over and it, it, he was just so blown away by it because matt also is say which one about matt but he is a, a very smart guy who's very interested in the natural world and uh, just finds the whole thing fascinating and he's even probably even a little bit more paranormally bent than i am in a lot of ways but he said no i think these are earthquake lights and which is, is a really interesting phenomenon that no one's really explored so far because so many of these uh orb observations happen in places just like that. Um, I think, I think that kind of thing needs to be explored a bit more too. Um, but again, I don't, I don't run into a lot of paranormal reports in general. And some people say, Oh, that's because they know you're not going to listen or blah, blah, blah. And, they, and so they, they think there's some sort of witness um, uh, bias in that sort of way. I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, I just don't think that a lot of that stuff happens. Um, of course, I also know people who go out every time and have Bigfoot's talking to them in their head and, and like Jesus appears to them or whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. I don't believe that because it happens every time, um, you know, so it's one of those things. But I, I listen. I always write it down. I don't ignore that stuff. It's just that it, it, it happens so infrequently that statistically speaking, they're outliers. Um, now, do I I don't think Sasquatches are at all paranormal. Not at all. Everything I've and, and and the reason I don't think that is for the same reason that the paranormal people think they are because of their personal experience. You know, at the end of the day, I have a different experience than these people. Everything I've experienced in the woods indicates a perfectly normal mammal. And what they have experienced, it points them to something else depending on what their cultural background is, essentially. Um, the religious folk think that these things are here to glorify God or Jesus. Or another guy told me that these are here, the Sasquatches are here, put here by Satan in order to detract from the glory of Jesus. All right. Okay. Wh which one is it, man? I don't know. Yeah, you know, um, so my personal experience indicates that these things are perf perfectly normal animals, as does the evidence. Um, so I'm going with it. I'm an evidence-based guy and I have my own personal subjective things um, that influence the way I think. So far, nothing nothing points me to think that these things are anything but a perfectly normal animal. And if other people have those experiences, great, good for you. Um, but you're basing it on your subjective thing. I need to do the same thing. You should at least allow me that same freedom that you give yourself, you know? Shocker cliff. This is another two part question. <laughs> did I get both of the last ones? I don't even know. I don't even you know. Did. You kind of answered it already. The last part of that was, it was more focused on Ron Moorhead's. Oh, Ron. I, uh, I like Ron's. Uh, I, I like Ron's recordings. Um, I don't like the footprints that were found at the site. I've got great concerns about those. Um, and as far as his quantum stuff goes, I mean, to be fair, I like Ron, but I don't. I'm not sure he really understands quantum mechanics because I know I don't, and I took college level physics, um, and I and I don't understand the math behind it. And and I but I do know enough from my science background, especially my my astronomical pursuits, my my amateur astronomy stuff, that um, quantum mechanics is about the very 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 small, like subatomic small. Um, and when you get bigger, when when the things that we're talking about get bigger, they, the the rules break down, the physics, the math there breaks down. It doesn't work anymore. Just like on a galactic scale. We have Einstein's relativity and when, and turns out that the math works great until you get small, you know? So right now um, the, the physicists in the world are going after what's called the gut, the grand unification theory that will um, have one set of uh, one set of, um, um, you know, like, like one mathematical rule that will unite the two, you know, 
um, uh, um, and, and that's the grand unification theory. Um, so I don't see how Sasquatches, which are relatively large compared to an atom, you know, um, I don't see how they would be obeying the rules of quantum entanglement, for example. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, it, 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 it seems ridiculous to me, honestly. Um, yeah, I, I bet, you know, Ron's exploring a lot of areas. I mean, I know he talked about DMT in his book a little bit. I asked him if he'd ever done it. He said, no. And I said, well, I don't know if you're writing about that kind of stuff. Maybe you should have done it or something. It's a drug. I don't know if you know that or not. Um, it, it, um, but th there's, you know, there's a lot of things in Ron's books that he's, he, I think he's just kind of poking, you know, he's just kind of poking various topics to see, well, maybe there's something here. Even if I don't understand it, maybe there's something there. And maybe there is. But I just don't see any reason to think that Sasquatches do it, but bears wouldn't, or we don't, or anything like that. It just That doesn't make sense to me. So, Billy wants your honest opinion on a couple of things. He asks, is there a decided advantage, in your opinion, to uh, an habituation area versus other methods of discovery? And the second part of that is how often do you actually get close enough to see a Sasquatch by doing tree knocks, trying to simulate yells and screams? Okay. Well, um, habituations. I don't like that word because it's, it's really, it's a word with a lot of baggage on it now, in my opinion. Um, uh, I, I like uh, the term long-term witness. I think Autumn Williams is the person who coined that one first and uh, great respect for her. And she worked very closely with a lot of these people, um, has a lot of experience in that sort of thing. Um, but uh, I, I like that term because I think it, it, it sums it up better. I don't, I personally don't think you can actually habituate a Sasquatch in the same way that you can habituate a bear. Um, they might be around more often. They might feel comfortable there. And certainly there's something going on with uh, native reservations and that sort of thing. But that's, is that true habituation? I don't think so. I don't, that's not what I would call that. I would call that long-term witness because they see, they glimpse these things or observe them visually or otherwise with their ears um, fairly often, or at least more than once over a long period of time. And these situations are very useful because, uh, in those situations, wherever the person is living is the natural environment of a Sasquatch, or at least a very small sliver of it as they wander through. And I think that that's a really neat opportunity to get uh, kind of um, get a baseline for Bigfoot behavior in some ways. Or I know it's not really true because they're acting a certain way around a human in a way, whether they know they're being observed or not. You know, you could hide inside your house and peek out the, the window or whatever, and the Sasquatch wouldn't know it's being observed. But still, they're acting differently because they're near humans in some ways. Um, but I think those are very interesting and show a lot of promise for possible um, evidence um, and also observations of their behaviors and social structures, which is, again, what I'm really interested at this point is their behaviors and how they live. Not if they are. I know I want to know how they are, you know. Um, so that's where my focus is. So I, I do work with several long term witnesses. Um, who have like one up in the Olympic Peninsula. I've become very good friends with those people. Uh, there's, a, there's another one out here, um, you know, in Mount Hood National Forest. Yeah, there's a number of people I work with that have them around sometimes. Um, but it's not very often uh, that the people notice that they're around. But I think that those situations uh, are, are rare and should be protected. Um, the situation should be protected, you know, like because we don't want a bunch of researchers messing things up. And in most cases, when I, when I deal with these people who are living there, I empower them because uh, we've seen this over the years that when researchers run in to be Mr. Patterson and get, I'm going to film these things and satisfy my ego and do all that sort of stuff, um, they mess it up because the Bigfoots are so sensitive. They know that something is different because they, as a, as, whose car is that? They wonder, you know, um, and like literally like in one spot in um, Colorado, the researchers had to, they figured out eventually that the Bigfoots were on them. So they had to park at the bottom of the hill and then the witnesses would come up and get them and bring them up and then they'd have activity. You know, just the presence of somebody else changes their behaviors. Um, but anyway, yeah, I think that those are really interesting situations and uh, we have a lot to learn from them. And again, what was the second part of the question? I forgot again. <laughs> I forgot too. I'd have to scroll back up. Yeah, I'm blabbing too long. Sorry about that. No, it's fine. I, I want to get to Jeff's question here because I this came across my radar just a couple of days ago and I actually read this. And he Jeff asked, what are your thoughts on the recent Flow Fox and paper that contends black bears are responsible for bigfoot sightings oh well th if you dug into that at all you found that that, that was not a peer-reviewed journal at all and it was just kind of spitballing it's like here's an idea blah 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 well maybe that's the maybe that's what it is there was no peer review there was no deep research i mean dr meldrum was interviewed for that story in my home 
you know, I heard that interview happen because Jeff was staying at my house at the time. Um, and, and he came out and talked to me afterwards and uh, talked to us because Brandon Tennant was there and Cynthia and my wife. And so, and, and he was like, well, I'm not, I don't know about that one. We'll see how that one turns out. But he kind of, and then he started to look at this. It's not a peer reviewed journal. They didn't do really the, the foundational research on this. And they're saying that one out of, uh, um, it can be, it can, it, what, what they said something weird, which is like um, out of, like what 900 reports can be explained away by black bears. Well, what about all the other ones? They didn't address that at all. They just kind of swept that under the rug with everything else. Like, Oh, well, if so many can be explained by black bears and probably all of them can, well, that's not what their, that quote unquote research said. Um, it said one out of 900 could be not, not black bears, but also I just don't buy that. I just don't buy that. Um, it, I think it's pretty shoddy research. And of course the media loved it because the media loves shoddy research um, and took it and ran with it. Um, Sasquatches are real. And I know that from my own personal experience and whatever else, but I don't expect everybody to believe me, but to say that they could all be written off by bears. Well, I think Bindernoggle addressed that pretty well in his books. That's a ridiculous statement, but if Bigfoots are real, which they are, it seems to me, and I know this to be true because I've spoken to witnesses, people who sometimes think they see black bears actually saw Sasquatches. So it goes both ways. That's a two-way street. Um, I think 900 sightings to one Sasquatch sighting is probably, 900 bears to one Sasquatch sighting is probably a little out of balance. But maybe it's not. I don't know. I certainly think there's a 100 or 200 bears for every one Bigfoot. So I don't know. But anyway, I think it's pretty shoddy research and put out there, uh, dangled out there as clickbait um without any peer review or thought behind it so that's what i think of that study bill asks is, this is a simple question it's not even multiple parts which do you prefer day or night investigations and why do you prefer that over the other well um i i think nighttime stuff i think it's easier to get stuff at night because i do think sasquatches are more active at night um but at this point in my big footing career um, I've, I'm tending towards daylight stuff at this point. Um, it, the show's nighttime. And again, it, it's easier to do it at night. They're, I think they're more active at night. I also think they're probably more vocal at night. Um, and also it looks great on TV. So that, that's a lot of that, you know, it's a lot spookier, but the, the statistic, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, statistically speaking, we know that they're more active at night. Um, and that's from John Green's data. Um, it's 60% of the sightings happen during the day, 40% at night. But, you know, let's just say that's 50-50 for the sake of argument uh, and for sake of math. And you'll see why in a minute. Um, so half the sightings happen at night, half during the day. Um, how many people are at night are out in those places at night versus during the day? And how far can they see it, at night versus during the day? Like, I don't know what the numbers are, but that strongly skews the data towards showing that they're more active at night. You know, there's no way around it. Um, but I, again, I prefer going out during the day now. And, for, and there's, there's a couple reasons for that. Um, number one, I've, I've seen one through a thermal imager. I want to see one without a thermal imager. You know, that, that's a big focus for me right now. So I, I would really like to get daytime footage um, or just see one during the day. I'd be thrilled. Um, and also, I'm, I'm not I'm, that, filming one is, would be rad. And I would love it. But that, my, my main goal is footprints at this point. Because um, footprints, I think, are the most important thing we could be gathering because that's what's going to teach us the most about the, the, the animals here. Um, most mammals, whether bears or wolverines or whatever, most mammals are not studied visually. They're not, they're not, uh, there aren't like uh, biologists taking notes in, in a blind somewhere studying, studying these animals. Most of the uh, information we get about the lifestyles and behaviors and social structures of any mammal are through their spore, through the, the, what they leave behind, footprints and foraging sign and that, that kind of stuff. And that's what I'm looking for for Sasquatches, because I want to know what they're doing. I want to know how they are. You know, I want to learn about these things. I'm just fascinated. And so uh, footprints are a main focus of mine, because that's one of the only ways we're going to be able to learn anything about the species at all. And, and it's just so much harder to find footprints at night. I mean, it's so hard to find footprints anyway. Uh, case in point, last weekend, I was in a, uh, last Saturday, I was in a spot where uh, we've pulled a couple things over the years. And um, I, I walked in to a you know, mile, mile and a half to this general area that we were working. And then um, I said, well, shoot, didn't get anything. And I started walking out. On the walk out, I found two different sets of footprints that I just walked right over on the way in because their sign is so subtle. 
their their footprints and people oh no they're really deep and you can tell is it no no that that's so rare uh bigfooters mo most bigfooters who are just kind of fans of the subject and read a couple john green books and that's kind of where it ends they're they're kind of fooled by the footprint photographs and stuff that we see because they're all so clear and so cool and like, i see all five toes and stuff they all think it's a hereford cast or a patterson gimlin cast that's not the way these things roll man they have big soft padded squishy feet that are malleable and move as much as your hands do and their footprints can be very hard to see um in case in point i'm no i'm i'm not a great tracker i'm i, I mean tom shea is a great tracker. i'm not a great track i'm i'm, I'm a hobbyist but i, I do track I passed two sets up, two sets um, on the way in and on the way out. And they had toes on the way out. I happened to see them just because I approached the problem from a different angle, so to speak. I happened to catch them and I cast them and they're both. And we got three. I got three casts that day um, from two different trackways. Not bad. Um, so I prefer daytime now because my goals have shifted a little bit. It's not just about hearing a knock or hearing a call or something. Cause I don't think knocks and calls tell us a lot. Um, I want to learn more about them. And, and I think the only way I can get that is by going during the day. I want to be respectful for your time. We're about to wrap up. I've just got a couple of quick questions here. Wisebex from Instagram asks, what is your opinion on the Bigfoot nest? I'm assuming he's referring to the Olympic project and the nest areas that they found there. What is your opinion on the nests? Well, I think they're Bigfoot nests. I mean, I think that the first set, of, there's two nest sites now, first and second nest site, right? The first nest site, um, well, they found those rocks that had been hit together. There were score marks on the rocks. You know, so that's not bears doing that. Right. Um, and also they brought in biologists that said, well, if this is bear behavior, this is undocumented bear behavior. They don't do this. I think that's a pretty strong indicator. And bears are really the only other possible culprit um, for this. Um, and keep in mind now that this is an area where, um, you know, there, there have been other sightings inside this private land, inside this logging land that these things are on. Um, and now the new nest site. That was that were discovered in February 2020. I think I got I was out there within a week after um, Shane and Todd discovered those, um, checking things out. And uh, in fact, somewhere around here, over there, I, we I have a, a, a big 40 gallon bag full of nesting material from those particular things. I'm, I'm in the top. I'm I'm up upstairs at the museum right now. Um, but when we were at that nest, the second nest site, we found handprints, handprints, as well as uh, I think I personally found three or four footprints, some of which were underneath the, the nesting material. So the print was put there before the nesting material was. Um, yeah, those are Sasquatch. Those are Sasquatch nests. Um, and interestingly enough, particularly the second, the second nest site is so interesting because um, what I believe I learned from that, um, which makes perfect sense, is that that Sasquatch seems to have been repurposing a bear den to their own use. Um, because we found bear hair there. And of course, skeptics go, oh, see, it's just a bear nest, blah, blah, blah. No, no, dude, the bear, handprints, don't forget that. Handprints and footprints with toes. Um, that was not a bear, that was, those were not bear handprints, you know. Um, but, and um, the, 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 see that there was this log or whatever, and there's this little hole under the log, and something was there on the ground scooping out dirt and making a tailings, a pile of tailings there. And that's where one of the handprints was in the tailings itself. So this thing was scooping out and digging out underneath this log that was the bear den. It was scooping it out for its own purpose, which is exactly a reason. Well, to me, it's a very reasonable behavior for an intelligent ape-like thing doing stuff. Because, you know, they don't want to exp expend more energy than they have to. And bears aren't a problem for them. Just keep the bears away and I'm going to use their hole. They've already dug it out. It's perfect. Just like I think that they do power scavenging with coyotes. Another great way to expend fewer calories, getting the calories they need to stay alive. They are utilizing other animals to their benefit, just like all the other animals do too. It's not nothing earth shattering. So that's what I think of the nests. Um, I think that they are absolutely Sasquatch nests. And a lot of people don't know about this. There's a great um, investigator, a woman named Lori, who I'm very good friends with. Um, she happens to have been working that same area. She just like, she walks her dog every day or dog Marley. Um, I'm, I'm Marley's godfather, I think, if I remember right. Um, uh, Lori uh, has been working this area unbeknownst to the Olympic project for many, many years before they were there. Um, and since 2000, I'll say 14, but it might be 15, um, she's been casting prints in the area. And all of her footprint casts 
um, of at least two and maybe three different individuals all come from two or three miles on any side of the nest site. Now, not in the nest site because you're not allowed in there. It's gated area. It's logging land. You're not, it's, it's private land. You're not allowed there. But she's been working the area all around it for years and has been successfully pulling footprint casts. Um, and which is really interesting. This, this is cool. A few years ago, she took a report from this, this, uh, this gentleman, this kid, um, who saw two Sasquatches running down the hill, crossing the road a little ways down from where he had his car parked and then running into this meadow swamp thing. Um, so she told me about it. I got out there and maybe two, three days later, I don't remember. Um, and it was Shane Corson. He was there. And um, Shane and I looked around and then we crossed the river, which is important because Lori did not. Lori uh, is a, can't swim. So she doesn't fool around with water. She's terrified of it. Um, so Shane and I crossed the river and, and started scouring the meadow on the other side. And um, I found a pretty big log, about three foot, two and a half, three feet in diameter, about eight feet long, six feet long, moved to the side. And that, that happened in the last day or two because the, the green shoots and stuff coming up from underneath it and it was bare dirt and stuff. And not eight feet away from that, a Sasquatch footprint um, next to it. And um, Lori didn't plant that. She'd never crossed the river. She was terrified of that. Shane and I found that. Um, and it was the same individuals that have been found north, south, east, and west of the nest site for years. And then we have the nest site pretty much right smack dab in the middle of all that. There's a lot of supporting evidence that those are, in fact, Sasquatch nests. Awesome. Last question kind of ties in. I'm very stoked that you guys are coming up to the Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference in Gatlinburg in July. I will actually be there. They've asked me to handle the onstage uh, encounters portion of that. So I'm stoked that I'll get to hang out. You, Matt Moneymaker, and Renee Holland are going to be there to speak. And the last question kind of ties into that. Keith from here in North Carolina, in my home state, asks, are you or any of the team, I'm assuming he's talking about Matt and Renee, planning to go out and do any nighttime investigations or any investigations while you're out in the Smokies at the conference in July? I am not. I, don't, I can't speak for Matt or Renee, of course, but I, I am not just because these are jobs. I tend to get in and get out as much as I can, as quickly as I can, because I have pressing responsibilities back at home as well. Um, and I, and really, after, I mean, I've been saying this a lot lately, and I think it's starting to sink into the community. I am, am, a, am a, a, a true introvert. Um, I am a professional extrovert. I'm really good at talking to people and making people comfortable and, and meeting a thousand people in a day. I'm, I'm, that's, I'm good at that, but that's not my natural inclination. So after, you know, eight to 10 or sometimes 12 hours or more of, you know, taking pictures and meeting people and listening to stories and signing things and selling stuff for the museum and all that jazz, the last thing I want to do is go spend six, six, you know, more hours out in the woods walking around with generally people I don't know. Um, I, I kind of just want to go to the hotel room and chill and be quiet and not speak and not try to do much of anything. If I do anything like that at all in, in those places, um, it's usually with a, a, like one or two people that I personally know after the events. Because when the events are going on, it's it, honestly, for me, it's just too taxing. I just can't take it. I, I, there's only... I, I don't think a lot of people understand or appreciate how much um, energy that takes to to do that all day long, especially for me, who's, who's really a quiet introvert at the end of the day. I'm really good at talking and people and I'm good at that, but it's it, it takes a lot out of me, man. Like I feel like I ran a, a marathon. Like uh, and did a bunch of like 600 pushups and and dug a hole, you know, I mean, that's what I feel like after these shows sometimes, um, because yeah, people are wonderful and don't get me wrong, but I, I am a quiet, introverted homebody who prefers to go to the woods alone, you know, or with one other person and just enjoy the silence. Um, so those days are really taxing on me. It's a job at the end of the day. And it's not, it's a, I'm very lucky to have that job. I'm not saying I don't enjoy it. That's not what I'm saying at all. I want, I, I want to be careful with my words because I don't want to give the wrong impression. I am so deeply thankful and have such high level of gratitude towards the universe pre for presenting this opportunity to me to make to make other people happy. So it's like Kermit the Frog in the Muppet movie, you know, like making millions of people happy. Um, I get to do that by chasing my own interests. Not a lot of people get to have that. And I'm extraordinarily appreciative of it. I mean, don't get me wrong. 
but man, it sure saps me of almost everything I have. Um, I really, in some ways, feel like it just takes everything I have, like everything I have to even get it, to keep it up. Um, but so, no, I, I don't think I, I, I just don't expect to be able to get out into the woods. God, and really the, the traffic in Gatlinburg anyway, like who would want to drive? Like if, if, if I have to rent a car to get there, my car stand put until I leave. Um, yeah, last time I was in Gatlinburg, I, I did a little sightseeing and stuff on the way out and walk some trails looking for prints and stuff. Because Smoky Mountain National Park is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Just I love that area of the country. I love the people. I, I just love I just love that part of, of, of the South, essentially. You know, that and so I, I I would like to spend more time there, but I just can't tag it on to a job because that those jobs, I know I'm standing at a table, but I, I just can't even describe to you how tired. Um, that makes me after a day, you know, I mean, and, and I'm, and I'm, I'm sure there are people out there, dude, I dig holes. I, I, I lift bags of concrete for a living that can't possibly make you tight. Yeah, yeah. Different strokes for different folks, man. Like that really takes a lot out of me. Um, it, it's a psychological, definitely, psychological energy, you know, so I can, I can definitely relate. I am a professional extrovert as well. I was there as a vendor for the show last year and there was probably, I think they estimated six or 7,000 people came through there. And I'm satisfied that I talked to at least three and a half thousand people that came up to my table and wanted pictures and talking about the show. And I too, like you was invited a couple of times to go out with investigators that night. And I was completely wiped out. I just had to go back to my hotel and just crash because it does take a lot out of you. But I know I want to be respectful of your time. Is there anything coming up that you want to talk about, Cliff? Other than that, is there anything that's coming up at the North American Bigfoot Center or on Cliff and Bobo, uh, the, the podcast, uh, Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo? Is there anything you want to plug before we get out of here? Uh, not, not, I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely want to plug the museum because that's where my main focus is at this point. I'm, I'm literally here right now. Um, and I think we've got a lot of really interesting things going on at the museum that maybe other people would be interested in, um, you know, because we, we, the, the museum basically has uh, three goals in mind. Um, first goal is education to the public, that these things are real. They've always been there. No reason to stay out of the woods because they're there, but they are there. And if you see one that doesn't make you crazy or drunk or anything, that just makes you lucky. And you should share that information. Um, don't worry about them. There are, they've been there forever. And they're there right now. So everybody can relax. So that's number one, um, education. Number two, um, we're also uh, using data and those, those citing reports and whatnot to drive our field research. And it's been working. One of our spots has yielded five footprint finds. And actually, take that back. There's somebody else out there right now uh, who got another cast this weekend. Six or seven footprint finds in about two and a half years, um, including a sighting. Um, in this one area. So we have a really good spot. We have got several good spots. That's just one of them. Um, and somebody pulled a cast out of there this past weekend. So I wanted to mention that. But we've got a couple other spots we've, we've cast footprints at as well. Blueberry Bog is one of them. We give nicknames so we can talk about it. The Blueberry Bog is one. Uh, Will Call Hill, I got a cast out of there last year or two years ago. So the data that's coming in, we're, we're using it to drive our research. Um, which is, I think I would want to encourage everybody to do that. Really don't just choose a spot by throwing a dart at a board, use the data to drive your research. Um, and then number three, which is a, a project that I'm particularly passionate about. We uh, here at the NABC are doing our best to acquire and curate and preserve historical collections. Um, because the first generation of Bigfooters are all but gone and there's a few of them left. And sometimes their stuff gets thrown out because, you know, like their grandson, maybe your granddaughter inherits it. And they say, oh, grandpa was always weird, but Bigfoots aren't real. So they throw it out. Um, but they're not, the Sasquatches are real. So these are, these, these um, collections, you know, citing reports and, and uh, witness interviews and footprint casts and newspaper clippings and books, and they have value, not, not a high monetary value. That's not what I'm talking about. They have a more of an intellectual and historical value. And nobody else, very few people, I should say, are, very, are out there doing this sort of thing, trying to preserve um, the collections of the people who came before us. Um, already, the, the museum has acquired um, uh, Barbara Wasson's collection. She's a huge name in the 1970s. Most people don't even know who she is nowadays. Um, and, but she's one of the early female researchers. Her and jo jo Joyce Carney uh, worked a lot together with the Bay Area Group and Renee DeHinden and those people. Um, uh, we've acquired uh, what was left of Dr. Leroy Fish's collection. Of course, he's one third owner of the Skookum cast. Um, and so whatever was left there, we, we have that now. Um, we have the Chuck Edmonds collection, um, who was a researcher back in the um, 1960, 1961. 
Um, so, and there's another couple collections that uh, that are going to be coming our way soon that uh, we don't have them yet, so I won't mention it. Um, but still, that's one of the main goals. So anybody out there who has anything like an old newspaper article from your grandfather or grandmother, or, you know, something like that, and you want a place to put it where it's going to be held in high regard and and archived for future generations to use, uh, consider donating it to the NABC. We would much rather have um, a, an old newspaper article than a $50 donation any day. Um, so consider that um, a new thing. And pe people are throwing this stuff out and it's history. And to me, it's like throwing out all the notes that were taken at like, you know, at the constitutional convention, you know, when they're writing the constitution, you know, it, it has a, a very high level of historic interest to me. Um, so if you have that stuff lying around at home, consider donating it to the NABC. Okay. Or let, let us know what you have, make a copy of it. I'm okay with that too. We want the information. So, um, and as far as the, my other projects, I'm doing some speaking stuff, you know, I'll be at various conferences, you know, um, that sort of thing. Um, and I'll be plugging away with Bobo on Bigfoot and beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We're coming up on our 200th show real soon here. We're gonna have Dr. Meldrum on for the 200th episode again. Um, but yeah, yeah, if you're interested in that, maybe you can subscribe and listen to what Bobo and I are up to. Um, we get a lot of good feedback on it because people say, oh, I missed the show. Like one of your questions earlier is I really missed the show. So, well, maybe listen to our podcast because it's just Cliff and the Bobos hanging out talking about stuff. Uh, we have guests on, of course, but, you know, a lot of times it's just us talking about stuff. And that's a lot of fun for people. So that's really about it, man. The museum, the podcast, I, I do some speaking stuff. That's about it. I've got links to both of those in the show notes. Everybody go over and check it out. Cliff, it has been an honor and a pleasure, man. I've had a blast talking to you. Thank you so much for being on the show. No, thank you being uh, for being so persistent and actually nailing me down. So. <laughs>